Nerd alert. Dork face. I am not a loser. I just have a bad haircut. Kind of a major dork. Oh, nerds. If you're into science, tech, or unique hobbies, you're listening to the right show on Get Nerdy With It. We interview nerds talking about their passions. This is Get Nerdy With It. Welcome to Get Nerdy With It, episode number 47, recorded on Thursday, September 18th, 2014. I'm your host, Jennifer Ruggiero, and we have a great panel with us tonight. Mr. Andrew Nelson and Andrew, I think you're out there somewhere. How are you doing? Hey, good. I'm back again. This is like a new record for me. What is this, like three weeks in a row? I think it's three weeks in a row. Yeah. <laughs> right on. And we have uh, Giorgio in the background there. Giorgio, my parakeet, is all over the place. He's trying to be part of the podcast and, you know, I just he's hard to keep away. If I keep him in the cage, he goes insane trying to get out, so I just let him loose and... Yeah. So you can hear him, huh? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Hopefully he doesn't fly into your head today. I hope not. I hope he doesn't poop either. Yeah. So. <laughs> I haven't heard of that one. Yeah. Is that a new one? <laughs> he does that. He does that a lot, and it's, it's quite <laughs> gross, but oh well. <laughs> well, and uh, Gerard is with us tonight as well. Hi, Gerard. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for allowing me to come on again. Oh, you're welcome. Always nice to have you on. And you got a new mic. Yes, I got a new microphone. Uh, it's a blue micro mic. We're going to try it out this week, and hopefully it works fine. Nice, nice. Yeah, I'm using the blue as well. I'm using the blue snowball. So, very cool. And uh, we have a fantastic guest with us tonight. I'm so happy to have him on, Mr. Taylor Karras. Hey, Taylor. Hey there. How are you? I'm very fine. Thanks for... Excited. Very excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that you're on now. And, and you are a fellow podcaster, so you're all set with your mic and headphones. What kind of mic are you using? I'm using the Samson CO1U. Okay. Pretty good? It sounds pretty, pretty good. It's, it's pretty good. Good, 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 good. Well, great. Well, we'll get into all that because I want to hear about your gear and what you record with and all that fun stuff in, in a few yeah. minutes. So okay. th- thank you for joining. Welcome. So... I, I guess, gosh, it's been a busy week in tech this past week, or actually the past two weeks, and since we last had the show, last week we had to miss the show, and so much going on, you know, first with the Apple launch, with all the new Apple products, right? We have our Apple iPhone 6, and then the 6 Plus, and, the fi- and there's a new 5C coming out tomorrow, too, and all this comes out tomorrow, as well as Apple Pay, and... Let's see, Motorola announced a new phone as well. And what else, you guys? Samsung announced the new Note 4 and the new Note 4 Edge. And that's coming out here shortly. I think it's sales. That goes on pre-sale next Friday, I believe. Yep. So, yeah. Well, still be expected. Fall is usually the day, usually the, usually the time of the year when new technology is released. You're right. You're right. That, it's like it's the most fun time of the year for, for devices and new tech, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to be upgrading, Taylor, to anything or anything? Anything? I don't know. I personally have one of those flip cell phones that it doesn't do much, so I'm probably open to any options: iOS, Android, mm-hmm. Windows Phone, gotcha. anything that impresses me. I'm basically looking for a phone to forte recording, so I can basically do that to record forte video. Yeah. 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 You know, I I have a an LG G3 right now, and it records 4K video. And awesome. It's, yeah, it's fantastic. I really, really love it. And, of course, I had to get the the big... I actually only put a, 40, a 64 in there, rather, a 64 um, micro SD. But I guess if I were to record a ton of video, I might upgrade to a 128. But, you know, for my needs, a 64 is just fine. So, yeah. 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 How about you, Gerard? Are you going to be... Because you're, you're Mr. Phone, and I know you just got a new Note 3, right? Yeah, I um, just brought an old one back to life, basically. Mm-hmm. But are you, um, you going to be upgrading? In terms of the new phones coming out, I'm, I've got my eyes on the Note 4, which comes to at and I think October 17th, they announced today. And Sprint. Okay, and Sprint. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm also, you know, I'm a BlackBerry fan. I know that probably anybody listening to that is shaking their head, but I also think that the BlackBerry Passport is a really intriguing phone also. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that that you know, I haven't really looked in, into that one too much, but um, definitely, you know, keep your and that's the thing. Open. Yeah, people just aren't knowledgeable about it because <laughs> they aren't marketing the phone. But you know, if you ask me, what I personally think I'll go with is a Note Four next because based on what I've read, it looks like a good solution. What about the Note Four Edge? I like the Note Four Edge, however. The battery life is it's a little bit smaller battery than the Note 4, and the screen is a little, I think, point. It's not anything that we would notice, but about 0.2 millimeters off from the other. So battery life and screen, and I believe also that there's uh, they both have 3 gigs of, of RAM, so you, you can't really go wrong with either model. I just know that I drop my phone sometimes, and I'm going to need an OtterBox, and I tweeted OtterBox last week to ask them if they were going to make a case for that phone, and they said they weren't sure yet, so we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, I would think that they would have, well, I guess it depends on how large of a device it is, how much it actually sells, and who all wants that. I know that's the one that I'm interested in if I were to choose between the regular Note 4 and the Note 4 Edge, just so I could have that little panel. It's it's different, you know, it's innovative, it's right. different, we haven't seen it yet, and I think it's pretty cool, yeah. Same here. Yeah. How about you, Andrew? What are your thoughts on all this? I know you just upgraded, so you're kind of stuck for a <laughs> while, so, but... Cellular devices are usually something that I think about once every, like, year and a half, two years when my upgrade is up. <clears throat> Other than that, since I don't work in the cellular industry like you, <laughs> I don't really think about it, like, any other time. But, yeah, I just got a new um, a Moto X. Well, when did I get this? Maybe, like, three months ago, four yeah, months ago, something I think like that. Just, just a few months ago, right. Maybe a little more. Yeah. Um, it was kind of dated when I got it, but I loved it. Um, I mean, I still do. Uh, it had the uh, Note 2... Um, right before that, and I liked the Note 2 for a time because it was something new to me. Because mm-hmm. I had like the bit, it was like one of the one of the first few phones that came out that had that like monster screen, like those phablets, and it was fun while it lasted. But then I was like, uh, I can't really do anything with this. And the thing that really got to me was like the working out. I couldn't work out with it at all because I couldn't take it with me anywhere. I couldn't strap it to my arm because it's like running with a brick on your arm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, somebody else was just saying that the other day, and that was why they're going to choose the regular iPhone 6 instead of the 6 Plus yeah. because of the same thing. Speaking about the Moto X, did you know that they launched a new Moto app available, the new Moto app voice or Moto Voice for it? And I'll put the link here in Skype so you could take a look at it. I don't have that in the show notes, but this is actually quite cool. So for anyone who has a Moto X, now you can program it and change it so that instead of saying, okay, Google now, you can't, to wake it up, you can make it say, yeah, I guess you can program it to say whatever you want it to say, and it will respond. Did you see that? I didn't. Uh, that's pretty cool. Is that just like an app that you can get on the store? Well, it, I believe or it's just it going to be an update. Released from Motorola? It. Or? Yeah. It's, it's okay. Moto Voice is the name of it. And it's, you know, it's already built into it, you know, right now where you can go, okay, Google now, and it will will respond to what you have to say. Have you enabled that at all or no? I did for a while. Yeah. And um, I liked it while it lasted. I I loved um, it. That was my favorite thing about the phone. I I stopped doing it because I sounded like a turd in front of everybody else. Nobody knew what I was doing. So I was like, "Um, (laughs) okay, I'll take the extra five seconds to just, like, punch it in. (laughs) So now, though, you can customize your own launch phrase to make it respond only to you. So So I can just make it some, like, weird, obscure, profane phrase and just yell that out in the middle of public and be like, and and it should already be Show me where this crap is. (laughs) <laughs> you, can, you can just do that. I think you should definitely make some just some weird phrase and then have your phone respond to you that way. Yeah. Just make my phrase, hey, you. Hey, you. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Personally, I think that this whole voice changing your phrase thing is just going to be something that's going to be replicated by other app developers because basically... This would not be exclusive to Motorola. We should have the right to say something other than OT, Doodle, OT, Jarvis. Right. And I'm guessing that someone else would do it. Oh, I would hope somebody else would do it. I mean, when because I would love to have that ability on all the phones. That's that's the one thing that I really miss about the Moto X. One of the mo, you know, the most. Uh, oh, here most we go. I just, l- just looked it up on the store and it said I already have it installed. Yeah, it's because it's so, built into the right, the OS. Yeah, that works for me. Yeah, so you should play around with that and change your your term now. In iOS eight, they launched it so that you can say "Hey Siri," but the phone needs to be plugged into the wall. So. 
What? What kind of that then? <laughs> So the only time I can think about this working well is either A, if you're in the car driving and it's plugged into your vehicular charger, right? And then you say, hey, Siri, and you know, tell me how to get to such and such and, you know, that kind of thing. Or B, when you're in bed and it's plugged up next to you in bed and you want to set an alarm or send a message or something and, you know, you're just lazy, you don't want to get the phone. Hey, Siri, set an alarm for 6 a.m., you know, and something like that. That's, Actually, you know... Yeah, too. I got in the habit of, um, sorry, go ahead. You know, I recently watched the movie, huh? Mm-hmm, and I, yeah. Hey, yeah, and I think that it would be interesting to just have the iPhone plugged in all the time, have Siri, that you directs, and that you pictures, that you music, that you anything, and basically, like, emulate the entire idea that you have a personal assistant next to you, you know? That would be cool. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. That would be cool. What did you think about her? That was an amazing movie. It was colorful, it was vibrant, it was experimental. Mm-hmm. I mean, you really get a sense for the kind of relationship that can exist between other beings, other existential, artificially intelligent beings that can grow into something more, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and it eventually grows into some sort of a romance between a man and a woman who both loses their ass at the end of the movie. So it's basically basically a double romantic story in, in turn into one. Yeah. It, I saw it, and I was just, it was a great film. I thought it was fantastic, and it, it was. It was, you know, romance, but then also just with art, artificial intelligence and how deep it became, and the fact that this AI operating system was having these similar relationships with all these people, and everyone was so happy. It, it was just really interesting. It just, yeah, it was really interesting to watch. So. Yeah, sci-fi romance. Yeah, I liked it. I liked it. Did did you guys see it, Gerard, Andrew? I missed that one. I haven't no. Yeah. yeah. Definitely download it or rent it or whatever. It's 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 a great film. So yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Where was posting that link. Yeah, I saw that too. The lady uh who does the Siri voice lives in Atlanta. You know, I, I really am not a big fan of that voice, so I changed mine out. Mine is the British guy on my on my phone. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know you could change the voice on the iPhone. That's oh neat. yeah, oh yeah. You can ju- you just change the language, and you know select. You can select male or female, but then you can change the language to. I, I changed mine to I think the UK or British, and there's right. an Australian one as well, and and they have it for Italian and whatever all the you know. But I wanted, of course, an English, <laughs> an English language. And, you know what they said, though. Hmm. They said, though, the, the the company that releases the GPS voices for Spongebob, Knight Rider, just oh, yes. have Apple do that. That would be awesome. That's a great idea. Wouldn't that Thank be you. fun? You're welcome. That, <laughs> that would be fun. That would be so much. If you could have voices like that, you know, celebrity voices or just cool voices like that, that'd be amazing. Just like steal yeah. recorded words that they have saved, like on the internet somewhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I get that out. Like an entire want. dictionary. I would love to have Arnold do it, <laughs> like an Arnold Siri. You know, that'd be fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well. Speaking about Siri, my I actually have a couple of news items, and the first one is about the iOS update. And, you know, iOS 8 was released yesterday, and, 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 I, and I have had it for about the past week or I don't know how long, because I installed the Goldmaster. And so I've been using it for a while, and I actually, I like it. It's, it's, there's some things that I wish it had and some things that it does have that's great. And so, but, but the story is about people that are frustrated by the iOS update, because evidently to install the iOS 8, you need 5.8, 5.8 gigabytes of storage. So when people have a 16 gigabyte device, it's causing them to have to delete a lot of photos, videos, apps, in order to make enough room to install iOS 8. And then evidently after, though, after you install it, it the, that space does free up. So you do get some of that space back. But in order to install it, it's quite a hassle for people to have to delete everything. And uh, ha- have you guys had any friends that have experienced that, or have you tried it yourself? Yep. I've got a friend experiencing that exact issue right now, having to, and it's due to all of the photographs on their iPhone over the years. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, the photos take so much room, you know. And so that's the one thing that, that they definitely need to, you know. And, and sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, just to add. So if I'm hearing you right, does that mean you, you need to pretty much have some – some good specs on your iPhone or else you might as well just go buy a brand new one to even have that operating system right now. Well, it will work fine with a 16 gigabyte device, but you just need to make enough room in order to be able to install it. And then, gotcha. yeah. And then go ahead and it will free up some of that space and, and you I, can, you know, use that space again. I have one word to say. Sure. Ouch. Ouch. Yeah. 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 This is basically similar to those Windows up uh, Windows versions, which get bitter in size every day. I can understand the need for new features. I can understand the need for new APIs. I can understand the need to like redesign the entire thing entirely. But 5.8 gigabytes is going to make a lot of people scratch their heads, especially considering that Apple hasn't done this sort of thing before. You know? Right. I agree. And think of how long that must be taking people to download, because if you're downloading it over the air. And especially on launch day, it, it must have been a couple of hours for some people, you know, to get that, that file installed. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So someone tweeted, uh, <laughs> this man, Daniel Zenon, he tweeted, uh, so Apple put the YouTube album on everybody's phone and then tell them that they don't have enough space to upgrade for I to iOS 8. So <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Well, you know, the whole YouTube fiasco about how the the album pretty much ended up in, on people's devices and, and now they don't have room for <laughs> iOS 8. Did you say that was Daniel yeah. Cialino? It was, oh no, it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out you know, to I thought it was a nice, yeah, You know, I thought it was a nice gesture of them, you too, to like release the album on their iTunes device, but then again... Many people aren't interested in U2 or don't want the album spontaneously downloaded on the device. They want to download it as they please. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. I don't know why they just didn't make it so that, you know, here's a free album and you can just go and, and proactively go out there and grab it if you want it rather, it, rather than it being in your iCloud storage and then you download it, you know, that way. The fact Probably that because up, they wanted to be ahead of the tab. Yeah, you're right. And probably U2 is able to count that as, as you know, so many different downloads, you know, then it would really probably put them up on the charts, I would think. I agree. Yeah, that's interesting. So, I don't know. I, you know, the 16 gig, yeah, I can, I, I, shockingly, I have not gotten a pair call from either one of my parents. They both have iPhones about this new iOS 8 up to, update, you know, and saying that they didn't have enough room. So I'm sure that I'll get that call over the weekend. They probably haven't even tried to install iOS 8 yet, and I'm sure that they will soon, and I'll get the call. I'm trying to install this update, but there's just not enough room, and we'll have to fix that for them. <laughs> so, But, you know, this is a good time, I think, for people, though, that are upgrading their phones to the latest OS to – clear out the junk on their phone. You know, I, uh, I reset my phone quite often and it's maybe, I think it's because I'm in the industry, number one. And, and also I think it's healthy to just kind of clear out your phone, clear out the data on your phone, just do a reset and start fresh and get rid of all the junk you don't use. And, and that way you have a lot more space and your phone works so much more efficiently especially when you're doing a big upgrade from iOS 7 to iOS 8. Doing a clean installation is the smart thing to do rather than upgrading all your apps and you know, just you know, upgrading the OS on top of the existing OS, in my opinion. That's what everybody recommends is to format their operating system, format everything, back up everything to a safe device and reinstall it. It usually helps with the performance. It usually and says that if the system is completely clean of everything that's buddy or mm -hmm. virus or just uh, just the fault of the updates, you know? Exactly, exactly. And that's what, you know, and, and that's what I do, especially when it comes to upgrading my computer, too. The same exact thing. You want to do a clean installation like that and just um, start from scratch, right? And have a nice, clean operating system. Yep. So, yeah. And any other thoughts on that from anyone? Okay. Negative. <laughs> <laughs> so, so one other thing that I wanted to – actually, a couple more things about Apple while we're on the topic of Apple that I wanted to speak about is I found this interesting. With iOS 8, 
Apple is no longer going to be able to have iPhones unlocked or iPads, whatever, anything with iOS 8 for police to search, even if they have search warrants. So evidently, it is impossible for to turn over data from these devices to the police. And it, That's true. Yeah. What do you mean? You mean legally or physically? Physically. Legally and physically. So the... the According to their new privacy policy tied to the release of iOS 8, uh, it, they're talking about an engineering solution to a legal quandary. It, it, it's, um, what happened is that it, rather than comply with binding court orders, they have reworked its latest encryption in a way that actually prevents the company or anyone but the device owner from gaining access to the user data that's stored on smartphones or, or the tablets. Well, theoretically. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's encryption. It's always breakable. It yeah. doesn't matter how much time you want to spend. I'm sure somebody will probably. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure somebody time will probably. And, and also, if, if Apple wants to tell us any, give us any hints on how, because I can tell you from a firsthand experience, uh, three days a week you know, working with IT detectives, they cannot get into a phone, an iPhone newer than an iPhone 5, basically. iPhone 5S or... Really, some of the newer iPhone fives, are, you know, they have they have to literally get information and permission from Apple, directions to you know go into those phones and, and find information. But any phone before that finds information instantly. Wow, interesting. Do we have um, nice insights? Do we know what type of encryption it is? Off the top of my head, I do not know the name of the program. I, I'll find out tomorrow and remember it. But um, it's, they've got about two or three different systems, and the newest one actually goes into a person's iTunes account, uh, account to see what they have, uh, see what they have up in the cloud. It says the key is the encryption that Apple uh, mobile devices automatically put into place when a user selects a passcode, making it difficult for anyone who that, that lacks that passcode to access the information within, including photos, emails, recordings. Apple once maintained the ability to unlock some devices on or some content on devices for legally binding police requests, but will no longer do so for iOS 8. For anybody that's into um, security and information assurance, what I just looked up um, says it's going to be a 256-bit AES key. Ah. Wow. Wow. Which is actually, yeah, it's, um, very strong. 256-bit yeah. from, um, from what I understand. Well, I mean, I have um, limited experience in the computer security field, and I mean, I have a degree in it and uh, taken a few certification classes, but 256-bit AES take years to decrypt wow. with a very strong computer. <laughs> so mm -hmm. is this a good or bad thing? What are your thoughts? I think this it's a great a, thing. Uh, this is a good thing for me. Even though Apple wants to keep its wall dot and intact, I find that, the government is really overreaching with this sort of stuff, you know, thinking everybody's a criminal, thinking everybody's out to debt the U.S., thinking that they need the information. And I think that Apple's decision is one of the best ones out there because basically having the device automatically generate the T, which they can't even access, is just brilliant, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. Yeah, I think it kind of bolsters their, their security. It's a little bit suspect right now in a few Few, in the eyes of a few people, so I think, especially you know me personally, it, I believe that this is a uh, a booster to their security. Yeah, the only thing that I disliked was that Apple was promoting that, you know, that their encryption was better than the competition. I mean, what about Microsoft and their attempts to resist these search warrants? What about Google? What about any other tech company? Are they inferior to Apple? Mm. It depends on what type of attempt you um you're talking about because Yahoo just the other day about a week ago um, they were contacted by the NSA to give up a bunch of data and Yahoo said no screw you we're not giving up our data that's private data and the NSA was like alright well uh, $250,000 a day fine then hmm. and that's how they pressured them into doing that so I mean you can have the strongest encryption but the government is still you know going to overpower you they're going to strong arm you because they're the government and they're assholes <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I agree. That's why we need. That's why we need a different. Yeah. That's why we need a different person behind the government, so they can change everything to us towards this new generation. Mm -hmm. Yep. To have us in the the best, their best interest, exactly. Okay. And I was talking about a legal attempt, you know, for warrants. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can have the strongest encryption, AES two fifty six. I don't care, but 
I mean, if the law is not on your side, you're going to have a tough time. And that's what I'm worried about. Well, I do like the fact that Apple's sticking to their guns and they have made this decision to make something this secure that will make it unpo- impossible for them to compromise their users' data and send that information along. I think that when we talk on our phones and we send email and we have conversations and we're having content, that this is that's our private data, just like when we're having a conversation with somebody and this is in person, right? That's that's a private conversation. And it, it shouldn't be able to be leaked or given to anyone, just, you know, regardless of the circumstances. Now, I might, maybe if I were involved in some passionate, you know, family, some family members were, invo- you know, crime or whatever, then um, who knows? Maybe in a different situation, I'd have a different tune. But just from a logical take looking in at this, it, I, I say kudos to Apple for doing this. You know. Yeah, they stopped up. Yeah, so that's what I, uh, yeah, he said they stopped up. Yep, they did. Mm-hmm. And another thing, you know, you know, the legal system, there's a, just a justification for the privacy involved because the judge may be sympathetic to privacy, but the NSA insists that there's a terrorist within that 700,000 results that... Somebody is using the Yahoo account to plan, which is unlikely because there are services out there that offer better anonymity, that offer better mm-hmm. offshore information than sure. these U.S. services. And I think that in order to, like, change this system where the NSA can press it, companies into, like, giving them the information, the U.S. public should be, like, standing up and, like, pressuring the government to sign a bill that does not allow the NSA to get private data. I agree. I agree. That's a great point. I'm going to say, I, I could be more upset, but um, let's be honest. Anybody who uses Yahoo is either like 60 plus years old or probably a terrorist. So, <laughs> oh, I mean, thanks, long, Andrew. Appreciate I mean, that, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. As, as long as Google, uh, you know, as long as Google and uh, Facebook are safe, I think we should be good. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny. That's funny. I I have a Yahoo account, but it's not my active account. My primary is my Google. So, um, yeah. <laughs> hey, Google rules. Uh, oh, Google does. I love Google. Gosh. And, and just tapping on, I don't know if you guys are aware of that quote that uh, I guess Tim Cook said recently about the government. Do you all know what I'm talking about? Mm. How he he said that we've never worked with the government and we never will and we we never and we never plan to in the future at all. So that's that- basically. Was a that, shortened version of what he said. Was that in the interview with uh, that he did the other night? I believe so, yeah. because I read that like yesterday. I remember. Mm-hmm. I need to watch that hour-long interview. That was. It looks great. I, I have it bookmarked, so I need to watch that still. Yeah. Yeah. No top needs will ever work with the NSA or the government. I hope not. <laughs> So, speaking about security and Apple and Google, another thing is about to launch here in October, and that is Apple Pay. And there was a great article on Engadget about virtual payments and what we need to know about our future of paying for things virtually with our phones. And so, let let me just preface this by saying, and you guys probably have used this too, I, I, I don't know, but I have been using Google Wallet for the past three years maybe, you know, ever yeah, since it launched. Too. Yeah. And tap yeah, I to use pay. it for strictly online purchases, but I, I like it. it. But you haven't tried tap to pay? Tap to pay? No, I've done, done the little uh, debit card that they that they send you in the mail. Yeah. And uh, I haven't done tap to pay, though. Okay, yeah. I'm talking about, like, Google Wallet and in the stores where you're at Sheets Gas Station or you're at CVS Pharmacy. No, I haven't tried it out in public. Mm-hmm. Or Walgreens, and you just tap your phone to pay. So I, I've been doing that for for about three years now. And I even have like a Google Wallet hoodie, you know, and and so when NFC came out, yeah, I do have a Google Wallet hoodie. I I was, you know, buying NFC, uh, NFC tags, the stickers left and right and, you know, and just like going all out with NFC. And and so I loved it. My my and still today, you know, people were like, what what are you doing? You know what? You know, you can do that. And they look at me like in shock that I'm paying with my phone And, and I love it, you know, so then. The one thing is that a lot of people don't even know about it. And then Apple comes out with, oh, we're launching Apple Pay with NFC. And now everyone is like, oh, you can pay with your phone. And, you know, and this has been around for a few years, right? So it's interesting, though. Google has Google Wallet. 
and Visa has something called PayWave. MasterCard, you'll, you'll see, you see that all over the place, is called PayPass. And American Express has their version of it called Express Pay, and now Apple has Apple Pay. And all of these use NFC, where you can just tap your phone and and go ahead and instantly you know make that charge. So curious if any of you guys been using this with your Android devices yet or I've never in never in my life have I used that. You need to kinda, enable that. Kind of want to. Oh yeah. I mean I have I have it enabled on my phone. I mean I have Google Wallet. I have the the NF what is it called the NFC, NFC like enabled yeah. enabled on my phone and everything. I just never I, I, it never crosses my mind when I'm at the counter. Yeah. So when you see the little symbol, the PayPass symbol, you know, with the it kind of looks like a like oh I've got like a little know. like a little Wi-Fi symbol kind of yeah it looks like the Wi-Fi like a turn Wi-Fi turn over to the right exactly and and then that's one of the ones that has it so I've been getting emails from like I got an email from Wells Fargo somebody else got an email from Bank of America saying that now they're Apple Pay ready. And I just find it interesting that it's it's all just because Apple puts their muscle behind it. Now everyone is all on board. But I think that, you know, that's great. I, I, I love being able to pay with the device. I think it is even more secure, actually, than paying with my credit card itself because of the security that's built into the device and that's built around NFC. And especially what is built into Apple's Pay system, evidently, I think they're secure system might even be more secure from what I'm hearing, but I really need to see both of them side to side, side by side about the security and, and what's more secure. I'm curious, what is NFC actually like? How does it transfer the data? Is the data encrypted when it's wirelessly transferred? It, or is yeah, it transferred? I think so. Right, right. Because I'm thinking like if someone can stick a little reader like right on the side of one of those debit card machines, can they you know, snatch your information like N- like the no. NFC that's transmitting from your phone? No, they cannot. Mm-hmm. The credit card companies are usually protective of their data because, let's face it, you're using the credit card, and if that credit card money is lost, then they, they lose damages while the other person that's rich it. Therefore, the communication is encrypted with the highest security possible. The NFC chip and the chip inside the retail pe- pe- place of sale Encrypted, so that when you place your phone there, and when you place when the NFC chip receives the data, it's it no no hat that can receive it unless they have some sort of deep trips in device or NFC reader to the alarm that deep trips in device. You know, exactly, mm. exactly. And yeah, let me read a little bit from this article here. It talks about how does it work and. It says, you know, there are two standards being used. There's NFC and ISO slash IEC 14443, which I'm not sure what that is. And we already know what NFC stands for. It's all, you know, everyone knows it's near, not, you know, national, it's near, near field communication, not, not, nothing to do with football here. And, um, <laughs> but it is also worth it knowing that NFC devices produce a very weak radio frequency, and that's what allows them to communicate with the pay- payment systems. And that frequency um, uses 13.56 uh, megahertz. So that doesn't really talk about why it's secure, actually. <laughs> so, uh, but they're talking about, is it secure? And, and some of the questions are, you know, do Google and Apple keep my credit card information? And the answer is no. Um, they, uh, you know, they, we want to point out that the debit card and credit card information is on file with both companies. Um you know, through Google uh, Play and iTunes, but there's no reason to believe that any company, that either of these companies would not be able to keep be trusted with keeping your data safe. Um, could your phone be stolen and used as a payment? So no. Um, in case of Apple Pay, you need to use your touch ID, your fingerprint ID to use it. And in Google Play, you have to use your PIN number. So they have to have your PIN in order to do it. Mm. And you then- gotta use, you got to use the basic law of technology here where... The newer the technology is, the easier it's going to be to crack, generally. Mm-hmm. You think and, so? And yeah. that's why I'd be a little... I mean, NFC's been out for a while. Yeah, that's true. So they've had their opportunities to make it secure, so it's not the most volatile thing you could possibly use. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying it's probably not as safe as a credit card. I don't know. They're saying it's... Uh, people are saying they think it's safer. I think it's safer than a credit card. 
And I sort of disagree. I think they saw the, the trying information were trying to make the connection with the bank and transfer the money out on the NFC chips themselves. Mm-hmm. That's the reason why Apple, Apple Pay is locked down, which is the same, but it's necessary because it requires the it it, it requires it's required for security purposes. You know, mm-hmm. you know, with you know, with Google Wallet, it works on any Android phone because the Android manufacturers have the option to build a secure NFC chip to Google standards on there. But Apple's just locking their NFC chip down because they have their because their system requires the NFC chip to be locked down. You know. Mm-hmm. So what does the panel have to say about whenever Apple opens up their NFC chips to everybody? Gosh, I am see I don't know if it would I think that the whatever that they have built in regards to Apple Pay is secure enough to keep it, you know, under under control and not allow people to be able to hack into it and to grab that get that information, but Along the same lines, you know, that NFC chip, like you said, is locked down. And if they do open it up, I, I don't know. Google's mass, Google's doing fine with it. Theirs is open, right? So we can use Tap to Pay for with NFC, and then we can use our NFC to transfer information. We can use our NFC with NFC tags. We can use our NFC to check into places, to open up our front door if you have an NFC door lock. You know, with so many different things that you can do with NFC, and Google's opened that all up. And I really, I, I kind of disapprove of Apple for locking it down and not making NFC open and just keeping it just to use for Apple Pay, and that's it. Uh, because there's so many other things that you can do with this chip, and I think it's, it's quite limiting to do that. But that, that's a great question. You know, I mean, what would happen if they opened it up? Would it make their system more vulnerable? Is that why the reason they locked it down? Maybe it is. Yeah, yeah. and I'm guessing that dual t- Apple is waiting for the moment where NFC is truly such a where no hat that can use NFC in order to, like, open up doors, unlock phones, mm-hmm. you know, the rest. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Nothing is truly secure. No, you're right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. I mean, it just depends on how much money and how much time you want to spend. Yep. And the whole point of uh, information insurance is to make that ratio of money and time spent to the actual reward of, you know, cracking said device mm-hmm. uh, ridiculous. Like, the point, that's the, you want that big gap. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, you're right, nothing is really... <laughs> In today's world, nothing is. I mean, it's actually I found an app on um, on a pirate website here that I've done some research on it, so I'm not just talking on my butthole here. But um, there's an app that'll actually uh, crack Google Wallet uh, based on your NFC emissions from your phone, and it will give you the pin to your Google um, Google Wallet. Really? Account. Yep, and it's proven to work. Oh no! Okay, it's don't obviously tell me that. You're it's crushing me. Crushing Obviously, me. it's not available on the actual Android market. You no, have to pirate it. But. Yeah. Crushing me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'm sure it was, let's see, what's the date on this? 2013, so it's probably mm-hmm. it's probably secure now. <laughs> I hope so. Something like this isn't going to last more than two weeks. <laughs> I hope I hope it's down. I hope it's not working anymore. And yeah. it's it's not working anymore. It's, this is September 18th, 2014. I'm guessing we've been a year mm-hmm. over ahead of we have a ha- year to secure the NFC and fits the bud. So I'm guessing it's gone. Yeah, probably so. This this particular app, yeah. Yes. Well. To sh- actually stay in line with, with iOS 8 and all this Apple stuff. It's an Apple show here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Gerard, I see you have an Apple story as well. Yes, uh, yes, I do. Um, basically, it's a shot that Apple kind of took at Google this week um, regarding a letter that was written by Tim Cook. Um, actually, it was at Google and Facebook. And in the letter, he just kind of emphasized uh, to everybody that, you know, Google does not have a, a habit of selling information to other advertisers. You know, he tells them that I'm not Google, but Apple. He tells uh, people that Apple has a you know a very straightforward approach to products. But before I, I even I guess get into this all the way p- from everybody on the panel here, do you personally feel that uh, you know, Google and Facebook have privacy issues right now, or do you think that it's just as you know, much as an issue for Apple or anybody else, you know, pretty much an even playing field with that. I, I'm not, I don't personally feel that one or the other has more of a significant uh, privacy issue than, than you know, than the other. Mm-hmm. 
You know, I'm under the assumption that Facebook and Doodle have privacy issues, but they managed to keep the privacy issues in tone of Doodle because they don't want the entire user base migrating to other platforms. Facebook and its users just don't care about privacy at all. They're willing to do anything to the data in order to maximize the profit of it. They're willing to buy devices such as Optimus Rift in order to get more information. They're willing to sell that information to other companies, other apps, other devices, in order to like maximize their advertising potential. And that's the reason why I don't use Facebook. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's and that's and and then the main. But this is mainly just the. Competitors trusting other competitors thing. Who's to say that we don't know if Apple's claims are true or not, you know? That's a good point. Right. You don't know. You know, they could just be just saying, okay, we no, we don't do that. And, and regarding privacy, and to answer your question, Gerard, I, I feel that Facebook abuses that more so than Google does. Yeah, of uh-huh. course, Google does, you know, when we're... Yeah. We know what we're getting into, basically, though, when, when we're using Google and we're using Gmail and, and we see tailored ads off to the side. And it really doesn't bother me. I mean, I don't mind looking at an ad that is tailored towards what I might be talking about or, or searching for or whatever it is. You know, yeah, it could be a little bit. People can call it creepy. But, you know, I'd rather see that than something that's completely irrelevant. And yeah, I, right. I, and I do know it is a level aware of awareness. I know that when I search for something, or if I'm typing something in Google, and anything to do with my Gmail, whatever, that 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 you know has the potential of of um, letting advertisers be able to cater to to what I like. And it's you know it's kind of weird, but are you right. saying you still look at ads? I don't actually have an ad blocker now, but oh, wow. <laughs> I was I was though for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and on Facebook, you know, it doesn't really bother me for some reason, even though they are using that data, and the, you know, but for the, I think for the naive user, that it is it is an issue for for the average, not the average person is naive, but you know, the the non tech savvy user, I think it could be more a much more of an issue, the privacy issue with Facebook. Definitely. Yeah. The thing I see with Facebook is that really the only thing that they can steal from you information-wise is your basic demographics and what you like. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, because a lot of the other information you put on there is going to be unreliable. Not everybody's completely honest on Facebook. In fact, there's a great deal of people that are very dishonest on Facebook. So, I mean, the only real solids are your likes and your demographic. And even even that, I mean... Not many people are going to like things on Facebook that they don't actually like in real life, but it's really something that's more standard than most of the other information that Facebook collects. Mm-hmm. I mean, yep, there's really, maybe. really no benefit to liking something you don't actually like. Yeah, that's true. You know, that's ex- true. Except for when people say, "Hey, will you like my page for me?" and you kind of yeah. because you feel obligated to. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And this and, is what and, brings me to my major point in life. It's all about trust. Mm-hmm. Here's an yeah. example. You drink Starbucks toffee, and you don't know whether or not they put chemicals inside it, but it tastes good. You, you know the brand is good. You know how to interact with customers. You know how they help issues, right? Yeah. You, you, may, you, may, you may focus on the chemical thing and not trust them, or you may focus on the bit of picture and trust them, you know? So you have to trust that, that Doodle is keeping information safe. If, if, you, if Doodle's not keeping information safe, then that's broken trust, you know? Right. right. And, and speaking on what you and Andrew are talking about in terms of trust, uh, when Tim Cook is preaching about Apple security on that letter, he kind of highlights the fact that he, he says that they don't build a profile based on your email content or your, your internet browsing habits and you know taking a shot at, at Google a little bit and then uh, another shot at Facebook by telling people uh, who re- read the letter that they don't monetize the information that you store and they don't you know read the information to, to market it back to you. So you know, it, it kind of just highlights both of what you guys said in terms of the, the importance of that. And I just think that anybody on the Apple uh, bandwagon or Apple supporter reads this, that it, it, it instills a sense of security in, in within them, I think, that was non-existent before he wrote that letter, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, it probably does, especially the people, you said exactly, said, exactly said, the you know, Apple bandwagon or the fans and they'll definitely feel more secure after reading something like this. So a good move on his part. You know, why not? Why not definitely. send something out that's going to be, you know, giving a level of security to my, especially after 
what happened with the the Apple Mail and or the what was it the photos the nude pictures and all that that fiasco. They've done a good job of uh, quieting that down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In which I don't even think that was really Apple's fault. It was just because people don't have two two factor authentication enabled. And you know how how let me just say this: if you're a celebrity, why would you not have two factor authentication on everything? Because clearly you're a huge target, and people are going to want to you know try to hack into your stuff. And yeah, you're a liability. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, if you're Everyone should have it, but you know, if you're someone who's not famous and you know you might not be in the limelight, so you you won't be as much of a target. But still, it's dangerous, and especially if you're famous, you're a huge target. So you need to have two factor. So I don't think Apple was at fault at all in that situation. I think it was definitely just ignorance on the other people's part. I agree. And yeah, I just wanted to share that uh, with with everybody here because I thought that it was a really good letter that you wrote. Yeah, I like it. I'm looking at it now. It's a great letter. Thank you. Well, any other thoughts on this before we get into some questions for Taylor? Yeah, I'm good. Right. Just keep in mind that this is just competitors trashing other competitors. Nothing new. This has even been done in the 50s. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. So I'm ready for the Trestons if All you're right. ready. Cool. Yeah. So so you are a podcaster and you have a podcast about Stargate. Can you tell us what, what's the name of your podcast? Stargate Talk. Stargate Talk. Okay. And when did you start that? How did you get into that? Well, basically, I, I, I started podcasting in around 2000 and. 13, when I had nothing else to do. I originally started podcasting in 2007, but those were just little random thoughts that didn't go anywhere. I was trying to find my way. Mm-hmm. So, so I started off with a personal podcast about myself, but then I realized I needed the experience, so I start, decided to start a podcast network, decided to focus on talk that wasn't being done. Mm-hmm. You know, there wasn't a talk podcast about the Soda Simpsons, so I made one about Simpsons, oh, and cool. I discovered that there wasn't one about Stardate, so I made one about Stardate, you know? That's great. That's great. And I uh, actually, I think, uh, I, you know, and I haven't seen it. So uh, I have not seen Stargate, which is crazy, I know. So I need to <laughs> check it out, I guess, right? Because if, you do, if you're doing a show on it, it must be a great show. It is a great show. Yeah. When is it on? It's on 6 o'clock p.m. Pacific Time, 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time on talknet.taylortas.com slash live. Okay. And and, it, and also when you're talking about Star Stargate, the show itself, that because that's a TV show, right? Stargate. That's that's it. This is the it, it, it's the movies. It's the direct to DVD movies. It's the TV shows. SD One Universe Atlantis. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, is your show live, or do you do do you, do you take live callers at all, or? The show is live. Mm-hmm. It is live. Wow. And we take the email, Trestons, at stardictalk at topnet.taylortask.com, and there's a chat room at isc.teachu.teachu.eu pound sign topnet that pe- people can join into. Okay, and all those links are on your website, right? All, the, all those links are on my website. Okay, okay, and I'll put the website in the show notes, but for everyone to know, that's talknet.taylorcaris.com, so that's T-A-Y-L-O-R-K-A-R-R-A-S.com. That is correct. Yeah, excellent. And so when you decided to, you know, start your team, how did you – tell us about your teammates. Who's on your team that you have? Well, on my team I have the knowledgeable Taitlin Tolley, who has an encyclopedic knowledge of Stardate. She's a nurse in Los Angeles, but she watched Stardate as Adele. She knows everything about Stardate. She's obsessed with learning the Stardate uh, language, per se, mm-hmm. the dual, the Jedi – Mm-hmm. Those sorts of words. Cool. Julian is an employee at DeetSit.HQ. No, DeetSit.HQ. Mm-hmm. And the, he's, he's also a writer, so his insight into the Stardate universe is basically exceptional and amazing. That's great. Andy Hughes is usually the wild thought of the thing. He, he's a Stardate fan himself, but he likes uh, funny comments, funny, funny observations, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And 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 a reason of this is Alex Ten Alex Hanna, also known as Tenvet, who provides a more knowledgeable suspect, knowledgeable, more knowledgeable uh, 
perspective of star dates. Okay. And and, and in this uh, in this show we sort of tease each other, we sort of make fun of each other. But the main thing is to talk about star date, talk about these issues, talk about what this show presents, talk about the impact it had. Mm-hmm. Very and cool. I, and and I found every bit of the team on Reddit. Oh, you did? You found them all on Reddit? Wow. Yeah. Was it just, was it just kind of like, uh, you know, uh, is there a discussion area on Stargate on Reddit that you found them in? Or just, you just kind of like friended them on there? And, and I, then... I found them on a discussion place on Stargate, r slash Stargate. Yeah. yeah. You okay. know, I find Reddit to be an interesting place to find podcasters with. There are a lot of passionate, devoted fans on Reddit who are willing to talk about stuff, who are willing to do this. Mm-hmm. Just so that they can give something back to the fans, you know? And I think that every perspective podcast that's just find their participants on Reddit because there's no other place to find them, you know? Yeah. Reddit is like the comprehensive place for all communities, film, TV, comic books, games, pop culture, etc. That's They just cool. came out with a nice uh, Reddit app, too, on the uh, Google Store. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. It's called Ask Anything. Ask Anything. Cool. Yeah, I'll check that out. That's great. Yeah, I do like Reddit. It's, it's a great site. And did you do any other any sh- any other shows in addition to this, or are you? Um... Well, we do Simpsons talk, which is a talk a talk about Simpsons, the current and previous episodes. You know, we have Tip the Tip on the show, who is usually funny and informative of Star Day talk. We have a recent addition, Binary, who who's uh, who I think is going to take Star Day Star Simpsons talk to the next level with his informative discussion and his awkward humor. And it's just the three of us talking current episodes of. The Simpsons, if, along with past episodes, and we're trying to make the theme around them, mm-hmm. and we're trying to do two episodes total, which ranges up to thirty minutes per podcast. Okay, okay, great, great, and, and well, we also do Time Toad, which is a podcast about the TV, film, media, music industry, and how the how the new generation is changing it. You know, with Alex Sapio, he's he's a professional editor in New York. Mm-hmm. And and he and he does he's done work for Saturday Night Live. He's done work for professional clients. So there's a sort of professional edge to it that only he can provide. Yeah, yeah. And he's a part of that. He's a part of that. Every okay. every person on these podcasts are a part of Topnet. Yeah, that's great. How cool! I really like what you're doing. That's really a you know it's because you're finding a niche, right? It's yeah. Not, and that's the whole key to success is really finding something that not you know. There, where there's like a thousand other shows on it or a couple hundred other shows on it. If there's yeah. not, you know, then that's really, you know, the key to success. So. Yeah, and I'm currently think, and I'm currently expecting to start my news department in like J- January of 2015. Oh, wow. With a recent hire I also found on Reddit. Mm-hmm. It's also going to be a weekly deep news discussion so deep, deep, re- weekly deep discussion so featuring the greatest dates. Basically, some, and basically, I'm trying to make the network where it can connect to the deep culture and provide something to it as well. Mm-hmm. That's great. So it's all kind of like geeky, geeky stuff, geeky news, uh, yeah. which we love, right? We love it here, getting ready with it, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> that's right up my alley. And uh, so, what what kind of equipment are you using for? I'm using the Samsung CO1U to record the audio. A pair of plastic Panda headphones because the professional headphones are too expensive for me and these work just well at blocking the sound from the microphone and I use a Tannin Rebel T3i with Spot Tam in order to retort the video. I use a Debut in order to retort the output from Spot Tam. I use a Dissin in order to retort the audio from the microphone wow. and from what you hear and I and I use the various plugins in order to remove the noise, reverb the sound, oh. excite the sound and compress the sound so that they're the same level. Oh, that's fantastic. See, I need to get with you. <laughs> offline and, and and use some of your techniques that you have going on there uh, yeah yeah definitely yeah because it sounds like you have an ex you, you know what you're doing you have all your you have all the pieces in place to, to yeah. make it work so and i hope to get more pieces in place when i move to a new location in hollywood are you gonna move now, only if i get enough money for my patreon <laughs> i hope so <laughs> that's patreon.com slash taylor Terrace. That's great. That's great. Yeah, if you want to put the link in in the Skype window or on, in the show notes, and I'll add that to uh, <laughs> to the to the website. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Oh, there we go. Got it right there. Awesome. Thank you. And Gerard or um, or Andrew, do you have any questions for Taylor? Uh, 
So you can go first, Andrew, if you have any. Uh, see, I'm on I your can't... Patreon site right now. This is nice. <laughs> Simpsons Talk. I can't talk, think Stargate of anything off the top of my head. Yeah. And I put you on the spot there. <laughs> I'm thinking also I can come up with something. I'll try to at least. <laughs> yeah, well. Um, I'm more of a Star Trek guy myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I now I'm. I want to check out the show, and you know, because I've never watched Stargate, any of the films, or. I, I tried to get into Stargate. Yeah, I, I just played the video games. Did you? There, there were video games. Yeah, they had a few. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. that. I didn't know that. Very cool. See, the Stargate franchise is massive, as well as the Simpsons franchise. Oh yeah. So where would, would I find your Simpsons talk? Basically, you can find Simpsons talk at http colon slash slash. Topnet.taylortas.com slash Simpsons Talk. All the shows can be found on the okay. Topnet website. Okay, okay, under shows. So I just click on shows right there. Yeah. Oh, right there, Simpsons Talk. Boom, right there. Wonderful. Yeah, boom. Yeah, got it. Oh, that's great. I love The Simpsons. Who doesn't love The Simpsons? N- yeah. Not everybody loves I The like Simpsons. <laughs> you know, it's a classic. you give me an idea. Andrew, what's your favorite cartoon that you watch? What's that one? Archer. Archer. You should do an Archer show. That's what I'm planning on doing, but I haven't had the nerve to work out people, uh, find people to do the arts or so with. Andrew is like the number one Archer fan over here. I'm, I'm literally the number one Archer fan. I've seen every huh? episode at least, and I'm not exaggerating, probably about 60 times. <laughs> oh my god. That's all I used to watch at work, because we were allowed to watch shows at work, but we had to burn them to a CD because we it was a government computer system. You're not allowed to bring any sort of removable flash media or anything like that. So, you so I, just had a bunch of, I just had a bunch of CDs with the Archer episodes on them, and I just listened to them all day, over and over <laughs> again. <laughs> that is extremely ironic, because Archer is a spy so and you're working for the government, and it's extremely ironic. <laughs> <laughs> I really Very thought nice. about it that way. <laughs> Very nice. Very nice. I like it. Well, uh, so this is great. I'm really. I'm really oh, podcast at six. I need you at six every day. Sorry. Oh no, that's okay. <laughs> that's my. That's my father. He, he wants me to do the boxes. Oh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm uh, not finished these three questions first. Then I'm not gonna. Oh, I guess do boxes. Where, where are you located? I'm in Toronto, California. Okay, so you're on East Coast or West Coast time. So you're at six p.m. over there. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Well. Uh, Let's move into, um, I guess, for the sake of time, actually, to shift into our pick of the week. And this is a part of the show where we each recommend an app or um, a service or something that we're really into that we like. So, and Taylor, I think you have a pick that you decided to share with us. And would you like to talk about that? Yes, it's an interesting app. It's Print Hammer Mill, which allows you to print anything from your iPhone into your wireless printer which is connected to the network oh nice so anything from your iphone you can just print over there yeah oh that's cool it, you know printing is a commonly underutilized thing it's needed for like in order to print letters in order to print photos in order to print album covers it's used for both both personal and business use mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and to print stuff from your iphone is just amazing it shows how connected the world is how these devices are becoming more advanced and Basically, how everything is working today. Though. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I do. Yeah, on in my Android, I print a lot from my uh, my phone to to the printer. So having a an app like this is really good um, to use. So Print Hammer Mill by Aftograph. So and it is free in iTunes, and it has uh, just about five stars. Like it has four and a half stars. So a lot of great ratings. The current version has four and a half stars for the rating. So great. Great, great pick. And for me, I am going to recommend something called Headspace. And I stumbled upon this a few weeks ago. And it is a meditation app. You know, so we work out to work out our bodies. We go to the gym. But this is kind of like a workout for the brain. And the nice thing is, is that you know, we all know that we have to meditate, that we should meditate. And it has great benefits for us. But how do we take the time out of our day to do it? Who is the time to do it? And when you do think about doing it, you just allow yourself to get distracted or you get into other things. And 
there's just so many distractions and then, and then you're tired at the end of the day you want to go to sleep and you know but what if you could just schedule just a few minutes a day every day to do this you now this app coaches you through meditations with short little meditations and it works up into longer ones and they focus on on different items but each day it, it kind of rewards you and then you move on to the next level and the next level and it's just a smart cute beautiful well-written app that works really well it, it is free and then uh, and it's only 10 minutes a day and then the, after that there is, there are in-app purchases where if you want to continue it um Cost. Let me see what the final cost is for it. Uh, where you sign it? Okay, here we go. It does have a subscription base where you could sign up if you wanted to sign up for a year. It'd be eight dollars a month for a year, um, or if you wanted to just do monthly, it's twelve ninety five a month. You know, it's worth it. I think. Yeah. yeah. I, f- I, don't know, I find meditation interesting in that it promises Zen and relaxation, and I haven't tried it before. Mm-hmm. So to do this sort of progression is sort of suggesting that there's a way for me to, to make meditation work. You know, I mean, Asian cultures do it, e- European cultures do it, everybody does it. You know, mm-hmm. exactly, they do, and they're so much more calm and centered. And and when you do do it, and, and I used to do it more regularly than I do now, but afterwards I just feel, you know, I just have this mental clarity, and I feel so at peace and relaxed. And, and I think the main thing is really getting that mental clarity, but. People do it for a lot of different things. If you you know set your intention and and uh, and really go for it. So uh, yeah, I mean this is just a quick way to kind of get into it. It, it. it is cheap for the or free for the first ten days, I believe, and it gives you 10, 10 minute sessions. And then after that, you can you know subscribe to the service. But even if you just try the ten sessions, and then you might kind of get you in the habit of of doing it, and you kind of do it on your own after that, you know. So, Headspace. I agree. Yeah. Headspace.com. Headspace.com. And Check that out right now. Yeah. Pretty, pretty cool. <clears throat> and, Gerard, I see you have something down here. Yeah. Uh, with the, you know, the release of iOS 8 and all that, and I uh, wanted to talk about something that Apple's doing. It's brand new that Android's been doing you know, for a long time, and that's... Uh, Utilizing third-party keyboards into the operating system. Yay! So basically, finally. right. So now um, I pretty much put up a link that highlights the top uh, eight keyboards that you can download from third-party uh, people. And of course, uh, we're all familiar with Swift Key keyboards. I even love Swift Key. That's yeah. my favorite one. Even yeah, same like, here. Yeah, Swift Key, Swift Key Flow is just you know. Swift key uh, has a keyboard uh, for the iPhone now, the iPad and the iPod, iPad Touch, nice. and um, I, I just think that they're they're really innovative when it comes to keyboards. You know, even the keyboard on my on my BlackBerry Z30, the stock keyboard is, is they they had a deal with uh, Swift key, and it's a uh, kind of like you just uh, predicts the words and it flicks you, you I, flick the finger up. It's really neat. I gotta just say, so I'm looking at Swift key in in the store. So this uh-huh. just came out, right? This just came out like yesterday. Right. Because because that's when iOS eight was released, right? And it already has one thousand seven hundred and ninety eight four star reviews. <laughs> I mean, it was just, that's one day. I mean, how how in the world? I mean, <laughs> I'm just awesome. like, oh wait, on the seventeenth. Yeah, I'm looking to see if there's any before the seventeenth, like maybe with the gold master that came. Out, but no, I don't see any. That's and crazy. honestly, that's a that's a really good move for that company because now they have a presence on. I guess everything except for Windows. I don't think they're on Windows, are they? I'm not sure if they're on Windows. I don't know. Okay, okay. And another one just want to talk about is just Swipe. Uh, it's another keyboard that we're all familiar with, just mm-hmm. moving your finger across and kind of making the word. I like that keyboard. It's pretty neat. Yeah, Swipe is, is a good one, too. But, you know, I do like Swift Key better than Swipe. Yeah, same here. Yeah. But I just wanted to talk about, uh, I guess, the fact that Apple's kind of opening up. I wouldn't really call it opening their operating system up, but allowing third parties to, you know, incorporate things to, that, that will substitute regular functions of the system, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad that you brought that up because I think it's really relevant, especially with the time, with the device launching tomorrow. But probably by the time this episode is actually published and get it out there, uh, people will already have their new iOS um, I'm sorry, their new iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. Yeah, I have an iPhone 6 Plus with the Swift key. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so great, great choices. I like those. 
And Andrew, I know that you just got off work, so you probably haven't yep. had a chance to. to I'm going to look through my phone right now. Oh. I already have. And I'm going to try to find something I haven't talked about yet. Oh, wow. There's actually an app that um, I just, well, besides Headspace, that I just downloaded <laughs> um, <laughs> like, yesterday, actually. Um, I saw people talking about it on Facebook, and I was like, oh, this looks cute and fun, so I'll just download it and, you know, cause some trouble. Um, it's called it's called Yik Yak, Y I K Y A K, and um, basically what it does is it allows you to post um, like status updates or like tweets or something like that, and it's based on your location. Oh. And it's completely anonymous, and it is a pretty neat system, wherein um, it's very simple, very clean. Um, people post status updates in your location. You can upvote them or downvote them. I'm sure there's a couple other apps that do this. It's a very simple this is premise. cool. And this is all anonymous, too. Yeah, it's all completely anonymous. Um, so. And it also has a sub-menu that lets you go to um, a university page, which mm-hmm. doesn't actually have my college, which I'm a little upset. Huh. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay. Oops, sorry about that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's a very neat app. Uh, living here in, in the biggest city in Vermont, I get a good, uh, good decent amount of status updates uh, for, for what small of an app it is. I don't know many people that actually know about this app. The only reason I, I found it was um, a group on Facebook for my college that I'm still in. So this yeah, is all... everybody a, was talking about it. And they That's just cool. kind of show, sent, uh, share local updates of you know, yeah. what people post. Cool. That's yeah, neat. so I, I just started using this the other day, and I've, I mean, it's it's mildly entertaining. I like, I get some pretty good status updates once in a while that I'm like, oh, that's pretty clever. <laughs> can you can you friend people on there? Since it's anonymous, I guess nope, not. It's completely yeah. anonymous. Okay. Yeah, there's absolutely uh, no no way that I've found yet to crack it and find out who's sending it. How cool! Can you comment on other people's posts? And, yep. Yeah. Yep, you can reply to other people's posts, upvote, downvote them, and it has it has negative votes. So if you think someone's a tool, you can just downvote them into oblivion. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. That looks it's like a neat. fun app. Yeah. Yeah, like it's just a little, it's just a little very simple. You know, something fun to do when you're bored. You know, you're sitting, you know, waiting in a meeting, and you're you just yeah, have nothing to just do. Just want to mess around. Yeah, it's like instead of <laughs> playing a game, kind of play with that. And just have fun. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. So I'm not. Yeah. Same thing to protect your privacy. Yep. Thumbs up. Yep, exactly. <laughs> Two thumbs up. Well, this has been great tonight, gentlemen. I, I thank you all for for your Thanks. time. You're welcome. I, yeah, <laughs> for your, you're very, very welcome. I hope to be on here again. I would love to have you on again. I, I definitely, you you have a lot of great commentary, comments and um, and brought a lot to the show. So, Oh, definitely. thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hey, Taylor, can you tell people where they can find you once again, where they can find you online? Well, my personal website is taylortas.com, but my podcast network is talknet.taylortas.com. That's it. Okay. And I will. And post, then my uh, Patreon is http colon slash patreon.com slash taylortas. So if you really like the network, if you really like what you're doing, if you really like the idea of TalkNet, then you should donate. Okay. Wonderful. So people should definitely do that. And I'll put all those links when I put the post up on the website. So, okay. okay. People can find me on Twitter, Google Plus, and those are about the only social networks I go on. Okay. And your Google Plus, is that just google.com slash plus Taylor Karras? No. I don't know. I don't know. They, they, Google will not allow me to use both, both my first and last name. Oh. In the- what in the world? Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's crazy. Google, step on it. Fix that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, how about you, Gerard? Where can people find you online? Uh, Facebook.com slash Gerard Truesdale. Um, Twitter.com slash Gerard Truesdale. And pretty much you can also look up my nonprofit organization, Crossroads Pathways to Success Incorporated. That's uh, uh, Twitter at Crossroads PTS. And I'm also on Google Plus, Gerard Truesdale. Excellent. Thank you, Gerard. And Andrew? Where do you want people to find you at? If they want to find you, where do you want them to find you? (laughs) It's it's always a tough question. I know. Um, Best place to find me probably be, um, let me see my, what is my Facebook? Facebook.com slash Cobblecat, C-O-B-B-L-E-C-A-T. 
It's okay. really the only um, social media network that I actually use. I do have a Google Plus under the same name, and I have a Twitter under the Cobblecat with T H E before Cobblecat. Um, LinkedIn, my LinkedIn is um, LinkedIn.com slash Andrew Nels, A N D R E W N E L S. And that's just about all I have. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. And for me, everyone can find me at JenniferRuggiero.com. All of my social links are there Twitter, Google Plus, Tumblr. Facebook, LinkedIn, whatever. It's all there. And for the show, of course, it's GetNerdyWitha.com. So be sure to follow us on GetNerdyWitha.com. We're on Facebook, Google+, we're on Twitter. So check out all of our links are on our website. And please be sure to subscribe to us. We're in iTunes. We're also on Stitcher Radio and iHeartRadio and SoundCloud and Spreaker. And we even have an iOS and Android app. So please check that out. Thank you for listening to Get Nerdy With It. Join us each week as we interview nerds talking about their passions. Oh, nerds. And be sure to visit us at GetNerdyWithIt.com.